Hello and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today's episode is part of the Best Of series, where we highlight some of the most exciting and enthralling and enlightening episodes from the archives of the Psychology Podcast. Enjoy! I'm very excited to have Angela Duckworth on the podcast. Angela is a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania and the founder and scientific director of the Character Lab, a nonprofit whose mission is to develop, disseminate, and support research based practices that improve student achievement and well being. Angela studies grit and self control, as well as other attributes that predict success in life. A 2013 MacArthur Genius Fellow, Angela has advised the White House, the World Bank, NBA and NFL teams, and Fortune 500 CEOs. Angela has received numerous awards for her contributions to K-12 education, including a Beyond Z Award from the Kip Foundation. Her first book, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance, will be published May 3rd, and I can honestly say that it is wonderful. Thank you for being on the podcast, Angela. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be here. So, Angela, prior to your career research, you actually done quite a few things in your life. You were involved in educational initiatives. You studied neuroscience. How would you say some of those things contributed to your interest in psychology and grit in particular? I had always been interested, I think, in doing something that would be useful since I was very young. And I think I, you know, found my way from running, you know, Red Cross blood drives and selling daffodils for the American Cancer Society to to education. By the time I was in college, I think I realized two things. Like one is just I really liked kids. I mean, I just I enjoyed being with kids and tutoring them. And I was a big sister. And the second thing I realized, maybe a little more at an intellectual level, was that if you're really going to try to help people in a meaningful way, kids are great because they are at the beginning of their life with just the math of it, right? Like that you could potentially have a greater impact on kids' lives. By the time that I was um, ready to graduate from college, I knew that I wanted to start a summer school for kids who wouldn't be able to afford academic enrichment otherwise. And I modeled the program after a program that used to be called Summer Bridge and is now called Breakthrough Collaborative. There's now many of these programs throughout the world, I think, actually. I was going to say the United States, but I think it's international now. So I did that. And I, as you mentioned, you know, did a bunch of other things. I think at the time that most people go to graduate school, it's around 22 to 24. But for me, I spent those years in my 20s teaching I was a management consultant. I did a degree in neuroscience at Oxford. I mean, I don't know that this was all planned. In fact, I know that it wasn't planned. But through those experiences, I came to the realization by the time I was 32, which is when I did enter a PhD in psychology, that there was a problem that needed to be solved with kids and education that I didn't think would be solved without actually benefit of psychological science. And that is to understand why it is that children are sometimes able to bring forth great effort and concentration to learning and to doing well. You know, when I say learning, I mean, you know, both inside and outside the classroom, right? Learning is also something that happens when you're, you know, doing a sport or learning to get along with people in your family or, you know, really learning broadly construed that we needed to understand the origins of effort toward learning and that if we could understand that, that we would be able to make a huge difference in kids' lives. And I felt that by going into psychology as an academic, as you are as well, that that we would be able to make greater strides than the kind of, you know, the wisdom that got handed down to us from generation to general. We should work hard, you know, discipline's really important. But I felt like we needed to go beyond that. Sure. And what resonated with Martin Seligman when you were um, looking at psychology website at University of Pennsylvania? Well, to be completely honest, when I was 32, I just had one child with my husband. We moved back to Philadelphia for the sake of his career, which is that he wanted to you know, join his father in a business in real estate. And it's here in Philadelphia where you know, my parents were living in the area as well. I grew up around here. So it wasn't that I, you know, flew across the country in order to become a graduate student of Marty Seligman because I knew he would be the perfect fit. It was actually that I happened to be in Philadelphia when I realized that I wanted to do a PhD in psychology. And I looked around at the programs that would be very easily communicable, and there aren't that many. And then I went through the faculty list in alphabetical order. And when I got to S on the University of Pennsylvania psychology website, and I started clicking around and reading things that Marty had written, I felt like he would be a good match for me in terms of his, well, he had done research on helplessness, which in a way is the opposite of sustaining effort on things that are hard. And that also that he clearly had a pragmatic or a practical bent. I think he's one of the psychologists, and he's not the only one, but I, it's a bit more of an exception than a rule, 
that really thinks about on a you know daily kind of like how is this going to actually change people's lives and not just be interesting from a kind of purely you know scholarly right. perspective. Yeah, and that's something I resonate with both you and him for that. So you did, you started to study grit and it emerged from a lot of conversations you had, Marty, and a lot of conversations you had with high level CEOs, with athletes, et cetera. I mean, you started this research, it kind of emerged. It's not like you started saying, I have this new theory. It's kind of you let the data create it in a way. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, my first and second years of graduate school, I was trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to study. So I knew that I wanted to unpack the psychology of effort and achievement. Um, and I had some intuitions from, you know, my observations of my own life, as every psychologist brings to their work. Oh, yeah. And then that's sort of, you know, what we do. It's very William James Ian. And I had the observations from the classroom and, you know, everything else that I had seen. But I didn't come into graduate school saying, I'm going to study grit, which I, which I define as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. Really, that idea emerged from interviewing people who were really high achieving in, in as many domains as I could think of. And that's a technique, a sort of like, well, okay, like, let's look at high achievement and let's look at achievement across as many domains as possible. That's a time-honored technique. You know, the logic of it is that if you only study world-class soccer players, you might figure out something that's just very particular to soccer, you know, like having really good calves or something, you know. So you try to look for what's common across different domains. And many other psychologists had done that before me, and I'm sure many will do it afterwards as well, because it's just common sense that that would give you a clue to sort of what the active ingredients might be. And so when I talked to high achievers, I asked them, I asked them about themselves, but I quickly found out that it's hard for people to talk about themselves. You know, we're all programmed to be self-effacing. And so I started asking them about the people that they most admired. So even if they were a MacArthur fellow, I might ask them, you know, who they most admired in their field other than themselves and to just tell me about them. And I think in addition to luck, which came up a lot, you know, this person is just really lucky to have this happen at this time. And in addition to talent, you know, this person has an ability to, you know, to get better or to, you know, see things that other people don't necessarily see or learn as well, that there were these descriptions that eventually became the grit scale. And the two dimensions that emerged in those interviews are the same two dimensions that are in the grit scale, which is to say that people who are very high achieving tend to bring forth great effort in a consistent and enduring way toward a goal. And the second thing is that the goal does itself doesn't change this kind of thing that the people are working on doesn't morph and change much over time. That doesn't mean that their tactics aren't different, but the sort of like the big thing that they're working on tends to be the same, not different over time. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So, you know, I've seen different definitions of grit, even in, in your own literature. I want to quote uh, the latest definition I've read, and I thought we could unpack some of the elements of this definition, because I think what you've done over the years, is you've gotten more and more precise about exactly what grit is. Some people might not be aware of the evolution of that. So your latest definition is grit is sustained self-regulation in the service of superordinate goals. So say that 10 times real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can do that, but I can tell you a little bit yeah. about why that is. Wonderful. What, you know, what we're trying to say, I mean, it's not the most beautifully written phrase, that's for sure. And I'll also say how, for sure, like anybody else, I mean, I'm trying to learn, if I were saying the same thing in 2007 than I am saying now, then that would say very little about how much I'd progress as somebody who's trying to understand grit. But I think in important ways, this jargony definition that was uh, recently, you know, something that I've written in a in an article in very meaningful ways, like the same thing as, as what I started out, you know, those intuitions from those interviews. Absolutely. So first, let me just say what I mean by a superordinate goal. You know, one thing that is clear to me about grit is that it's not just that your interests are consistent in some like very trivial way, like, oh, I still like Downton Abbey, you know, like, oh, it's, you know, I really enjoy the New York Times Sunday magazine. And yep, sure enough, four or five years later, I still enjoy the New York Times Sunday magazine. Those are sort of lower level interests or goals that I don't think that that's the locus of consistency that really matters for grit. What really is striking about people who are gritty is that their interests at the most abstract and general level are consistent. So for example, I would expect that 10, 20, 30 years from now, Scott Kaufman and Angela Duckworth will still be deeply interested in human behavior, human motivation, you know, psychology, right? And that I would still be interested in kids, which has been, you know, as you pointed out, like a very uh, true of me since I yeah. was a teenager. So it's at that level that I find consistency 
in really gritty individuals, not at these sort of lower level, more tactical kinds of things. And I think by invoking this kind of subordinate thing, what I'm also suggesting is that, and it's certainly not my own you know, work, it's really building upon decades of research in psychology, is that human beings are goal-directed. And furthermore, we can say that we have a hierarchy of sorts where there are certain goals that we have, like have a cup of coffee this morning that are really, really low-level, specific, concrete. Um, I'm regretting uh, that I didn't do that one right now. (laughs) Yeah, you should do that. I actually just had two. I highly recommend that low-level goal. But, you know, why do I have that low-level goal? It's it's sort of this for for a second, you know, sort of if you go one tier up, it's like, well, why do you care about that? Every time you ask why about a goal, you sort of go up in the hierarchy. It's like, well, I, you know, really want to well, you know, first I might enjoy it, but you know, another why is that like I want to actually be alert for like the next six hours while I'm doing something like writing a manuscript. And it's like, well, why do you care about that? Well, you know, this manuscript actually matters to me because it's you know part of you know project that uh, of like trying to understand the measures of grit. Okay, well, why does that matter? So I think that human beings are not only are goal directed, we have goals that are nested in this hierarchies where every time you ask why, why do you have that goal? You sort of go up a level at the very, very top of this like Christmas tree like hierarchy. You have this, you know, subordinate goal. And for me, it is to help kids thrive using insights from psychological science. And that's what I, you know, what I find, you know, most interesting about the consistency of interest in gritty people is that at this abstract level, you know, there's a lot of stability, there's a lot of stubbornness. And there's also not just having that goal because human beings are very capable of having goals that they don't actually do anything about. But there's also this, you know, active effort toward accomplishing that goal. So yes, it is perseverance and passion for long term goals. But it's particularly long term goals that are superordinate in nature. And you know, that passion and perseverance is really, you know, that it's describing the active pursuit of those super goals more than it's describing, you know, these very, very low level tactical uh, objectives. Right. Yeah, and I really like that model. I am so excited to announce that registrations are now open for our self-actualization coaching intensive. While the coaching industry has taken great strides over the years toward integrating more evidence-based coaching approaches, there is still a lot of work to be done. Many coach training programs still lack strong foundations in science and do little to incorporate research-informed tools, methodologies, or approaches for helping clients thrive. For 20 years, I've dedicated my career to rigorously testing ways to unlock creativity, intelligence, and our potential as human beings. Now for the first time ever, I have compiled some of my greatest insights to bring the new science of self-actualization to the field of professional coaching. This immersive three-day learning experience will introduce you to self-actualization coaching, an approach intended to enhance your coaching practice by offering you evidence-based tools and insights from my research that will equip you to more effectively help your clients unlock their unique potential. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Join us and take your coaching practice to the next level. Go to sacoaching.org. That's sacoaching.org. I look forward to welcoming you in December. We have lots of things. We have lots of goals that are not harmoniously integrated into into the superordinate goal, and we do well to apply self control mechanisms to inhibit those things. To just get nerdy for a second, you've argued that individuals who do persist over obstacles over a long period of time generate larger equal finality sets. Could you tell me a little bit what um, what a equal finality? I don't even know how to pronounce it. <laughs> equal, yeah, fina- do I. equal finality set is, and how that relates to over time, you start to substitute things that are not going towards your super goal. They're kind of getting away with, with. You kind of maybe get more coherence in the structure. Is that one way of looking at it? Well, you know, again, like the idea of equif- I don't know how to pronounce it. Either, <laughs> I have no idea. Equifinality, right? So it's an idea that actually, like, if I describe it without jargon, I think will be more intuitive. And again, this comes from you know, research scholarship on goals that were not mine. So I'm kind of borrowing from other academics. But the idea is that, you know, if you have a relatively abstract high level goal, that there could be many ways, certainly more than one, that you could reach that. So for example, you know, you might have the academic ambition to, you know, publish research and be a professor, right? That might not be your superordinate goal, because that's sort of 
it could be, you know, that you, there's an even more like why you could ask a why question that you could go up a, even more a level like I, you know, I want to be somebody who contributes to knowledge, you know, but you know, still this professor goal is not the lowest level goal either, right? Because there are definitely if every right. time you ask how you go down a level, every time you guess why you go up a level in these hierarchies, right? If um, you're only in fact, if your only goal, if your superordinate goal is be a professor, you'll probably live a very unhappy life. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I think it is, you know, the prescriptive recommendation here, the sort of like, well, what would be a good way to, to do all this? I think it is to have a pretty fully developed hierarchy where at the very top, it is a, you know, pretty abstract a thing where there are multiple ways that you could get there, right? Multiple hows, mm-hmm. right? So for example, if you really want to contribute to knowledge and, you know, time after time, the professor thing's not working out, there are other ways to contribute to knowledge. You know, you could be part of an education technology startup, or you could become a writer. I mean, there's lots of things that you could do to contribute to knowledge, not just being a professor. And that exactly is the heart of the idea of equifinality, that the idea is that, you know, there are substitute paths, you know, that would get you to the same destination. And in fact, you know, and I won't pretend that the grit scale does a great job of distinguishing between these lower level paths that are interchangeable to some extent, substitutable, and then these higher level things like the farther you go up in the goal tree, the more you should be stubborn and sticky and kind of, you know, unwilling to substitute. The grit scale itself doesn't do a great job of that. But what I do find, particularly when you interview gritty individuals, that they're really able to distinguish between the higher and the lower level goals that they have. And at the lower level goals, they're extraordinarily flexible and creative. You know, I'm like anybody else, just to use a you know, personal example, like I get rejected a lot, right? You know, from journals and, you know, you get the 12 page single space rejection letter telling you in excruciating detail why your article is bad. And then, you know, what do you do? Well, it's a lower level goal to get this particular article into this particular journal this particular year. So, you know, if you're gritty, you know, you're not, it doesn't mean that you're stubborn about this like low level thing. It's like, oh, I'm just going to keep rewriting this article and, you know, stalking the editor. That would be not grit. That would be a kind of stubbornness that I would not call grit. And I think a gritty person would say like, okay, well, how else can I achieve the higher level goal, which is to get this finding out. Okay, well, I'll I'll submit to another journal or, you know, I'll revise it and, you know, split it up into two articles and, you know, or I'll I'll appeal to the editor. There are all kinds of things that you would do that would be, I mean, that's the idea of equifinality, all kinds of things that you would do to get to some higher level goal about which you're a little more stubborn than, than the lower level ones. And when you get to the very top, you know, that's where I find that really gritty people are at the most abstract level, the kind of the life organizing ultimate concern, as Bob Emmons would say, as sort of the life organizing goal, like, you know, there's almost nothing that could make them give up on that. Right. So this adds some good nuance, because I think there's a lot of misconception. Well, I don't think there are a lot of misconceptions of your work. And it also is misapplied in education a lot. And and a lot of sometimes it's applied as kind of duty. Grit is just being like a robot and just doing what other people say. And they're missing the passion part of your definition. Passion, it's passion and perseverance. And the superordinate goal is kind of like a super passion, right? In a lot of ways, it's like you're organizing passion. So what is the difference then between self-control and grit? Self-control is something I also study, and it's highly correlated with grit. I define self-control as the ability to adjudicate between two conflicting impulses, one which is more immediately rewarding and the other which is probably, you think, more enduringly good for you or rewarding, but not immediately so. So at the heart of this definition is that you have a conflict between something which is going to feel good right away and is easy in some sense. And another thing which you think you'll actually find more satisfaction out of, but not easily and not right away. So for example, if you're sitting in a lecture and you think, you know, if you upon reflection, you think, if I really paid attention for the next hour and 20 minutes, I think I'd overall be better off. It's just better for Angela if she does that. Alternatively, you know, I could click around on my Facebook page during this lecture, and that would be immediately more pleasurable. That's the kind of conflict that human beings of all ages face all the time. And so that kind of asymmetric conflict, good for me in the long run versus good for me now, I think that's at the heart of it. The second part of my definition, when I said, you know, your ability to adjudicate between those two choices, 
What I mean is that your ability as a person to make those choices in your own best interest and to carry those out. So I don't mean compliance, right? Which is to say that somebody for, you know, your parents take away your cell phone because they want you to do your homework. That's not self-control. That's parental control. But if you say, as my 14-year-old said to my husband last week, Dad, I want you to take away my cell phone because I have a big test coming up and I need to study for it. That is self-initiated. You know, that was her, you know, her having some insight into this conflict and her asking somebody else to like help her get through it. That's the sort of self-initiated part of self-control is really important. Now, that's what self-control is. Like, how is that different from grit? My perspective on this is that, you know, anytime you have any kind of conflict between two goals, one of which is, you know, better for you, even if it's only a little bit better for you versus um, something that's going to be more immediately rewarding, you know, you have to use self-control. And that happens all the time. You know, it's like, I don't really feel like working on my taxes, but I really should because I don't want to be there on April 14th, like, you know, scrambling around. You know, I shouldn't have a second cup of coffee. I should really just have one because tonight I'm going to like not sleep well. I mean, all the time people are trying to deal with these conflicts. It's like the nature of, you know, human existence. I think where grit is different is the following. Yes, you know, grit often entails, you know, choosing to do something versus something else, something that's hard versus something that's easy. So there's some overlap there. But grit only pertains to those goals that are in that hierarchy that you would say like, oh, yeah, but that's part of my goal hierarchy for my life defining these are all goals that have to do with that superordinate thing that really makes me tick and gives my life meaning. So, you know, unless that that's how you feel about your taxes or that's how you feel about your weight, you know, those would be like, oh, yeah, that's a self-control conflict, but it's not really grit related. So for me, if I have to you know, work hard on a manuscript because this manuscript is part of a research program that I really think is going to ultimately help kids thrive, well, then that's about grit. But if it's just me, you know, trying to manage other goals that I have that are not part of that subordinate hierarchy, then it's not. Right. And self-control and grit, they're both part of the big five domain conscientiousness, right? Yeah, I would say that. I don't know how much the listeners know about big five theory of personality, but they're certainly correlated with the load on the factor of personality, which is usually called conscientiousness. It's not that they're not related to any of the other four aspects of, you know, dimensions of personality, but they certainly are most clearly loading on that. And I, I would say that, like, if you consider conscientiousness to be this, like, really broad, you know, family of personality traits that also includes orderliness and traditionalism and respect for other people's, you know, interests. And so, like, yeah, absolutely. I think that that's definitely what we see empirically. And also, yeah. uh, it makes sense when you think about it. I've never seen you deny that either, even from your first paper. What do you say to people that, you know, what if someone came up to you that's like, Angela, I think you're just rebranding conscientiousness as grit because it's, it has more sex appeal. What would you say to that sort of thing? Well, first, I would be really sympathetic to the idea that, you know, psychologists have a very bad habit of, you know, just like creating another word to label something that has already been studied under long a long history of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that's actually a really fair point to, you know, just a good caution. And here's what I would say. I guess I would say two things. One is that because of these high correlations with, you know, the bigger family of conscientiousness, you know, for sure, I would, like you said, you know, say, look, you know, you can understand grit and self-control as being facets of this bigger, bigger family, right? Like mm -hmm. family members of this bigger family. They could be a little bit related to other families of personality, but maybe that's a nuance that's not important. So absolutely. And so as you would expect to find, you know, there's been a lot of research on facets versus like these big, you know, very general personality domains like conscientiousness. And what's often found, as we find for grit as well, is that for certain outcomes that are more aligned to the facet, you know, you find stronger or incremental correlations. So let me try to say that in English. So for example, <laughs> with grit, you know, maybe you don't find that grit is like the single best predictor of, you know, all goals that are related to being a conscientious person. Like it may not be, you know, as related to well, and I said this in an article with James Gross, like it may not be, you know, the single best conscientiousness facet predicting grade point average or weight gain, right? So th those are better predicted actually by self-control or the lack thereof, right? Weight loss, I guess would be the way to phrase it. So it's not that you would expect this one facet to out predict every other facet for every other outcome, but for the outcomes that really make sense when you think about that facet. And for grit, I think about 
you know, where the whole research program got started, which is, you know, grit should predict outcomes that are really, you know, really challenging and that really do, you know, achievement outcomes that really do require a kind of stick to itness or endurance. And not all achievement outcomes are equally, you know, described by that. So yes, you know, like graduating from something like college when a lot of other people are not graduating in your cohort or, you know, finishing West Point, showing up the spelling bee again, even though you lost again last year. Those are the kinds of things that I would expect and have found grit to be very predictive of. So yeah, it's part of this bigger family. I think if I had felt that conscientious was identical to grit, I wouldn't have gone and, you know, labeled it this way. And I think the other thing that makes me think it's, you know, not the same thing as, you know, being orderly, uh, being organized, being self-controlled is that um, in conscientiousness, you don't really have a lot of the sort of like, I'm passionate about a lot of conscientiousness facets are about volition, like being able to carry out things that you really, you know, want to do at some level, but they don't describe this kind of passion to do. So you wouldn't say like somebody who's really conscientious is necessarily somebody who's like super passionate about something, thinks about it all the time. It gives their life meaning and purpose. And that's the, you know, as you mentioned, the passion side of grit, which I think is an important part of it. Well, you don't measure that on your grit scale, the passion aspect uh, with exactly those kinds of items, like I have a passion that, et cetera. However, research that we've done does show that harmonious passion and other kinds of items that do relate to that are strongly correlated with grit. So I think that's important to mention that even though it's not directly measured by your scale it's correlated yeah i mean there are no it's you know it's a notable that the passion scale doesn't actually have any passion words right so right. that's in part because i didn't find that language to so when you ask people who are really accomplished in, in their field to describe the individuals that they admire most you know they won't say thing well they didn't to me anyway that like it wasn't striking that they would say like oh this person has a kind of fireworks passion about what they do. It's not that they didn't, but what was more remarkable about the individuals they most admired was the consistency of that passion over time. And as somebody who's taught undergraduates for, you know, some time, I, I have to say that the kind of, you know, the ability to get just really excited about something, I mean, kind of like swept up and in love with something, that is, of course, a wonderful thing. And I won't say that there aren't high achievers who, you know, who don't have that quality, but it's more remarkable to me when you know, two years later, right. that kid is still really engaged in the same general project. That's the rarity, right? When so the honeymoon period yeah, is so, over. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so I think there is, you know, it depends on how you use the word passion. And I'm not here to tell people how they should or shouldn't use the word passion. But at least the way I'm using the word passion, I really do mean that remarkable endurance of, you know, when, when Darwin wrote his autobiography toward the end of his life and the end of his scientific career, you know, and he talked about you know, his abiding love for the topics that he studied, I think it really was the kind of, you know, fact that it was a, a constant occupation for his, not necessarily that on any given day, you know, he had more intense love than another person, but, you know, 10, 20, 30 years later, you know, the other scientists might be on to different things or off of science altogether. And what struck Darwin as remarkable about himself was that you know, he really did have an abiding interest in what he was yeah, studying. Yeah. And can one have multiple superordinate goals or is life too short sort of thing to really... You know, I think it's hard to have many superordinate... Let, let's start with the easy thing, which is that I don't think you can, by, you know, the fact that the day is only 24 hours long, have many, like, a you know, big plural, like you can't have 10 or 15 superordinate goals, right? Like I'm trying to become an NFL football player, but I'm also trying to become... NBA. You know, really Michael great. Jordan tried to do that. Yeah, well, no, he also tried, he did try to do them in sequence, though, I think, right? I mean, at yeah, least like true. for most of his life, right? I think there was a time where, you're, so let's just take the easy case, which is that it's hard to, for me to imagine having many super goals all at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. the day is not that long. I do think that you can then ask the case, well, like, well, can you have just two or three, right? Not many. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's a little bit harder. I think that that would absolutely be the exception and not the rule of the people that I have study. Sometimes I find people who have a vocational subordinate goal, like this is what I do for a living and for a profession. And it's a very stable subordinate goal. Like I am a venture capitalist, or I am a education technology entrepreneur. And like, I want to help kids learn through better technology. I mean, that kind of thing. And that's their subordinate professional goal. And that occasionally, I'll find that people have an avocational goal that is a lot like I'm also a, you know, fourth degree black belt in Aikido. And I, you know, that's the way I pursue. And it's not like I have nine hobbies. I have that one. Or Will Shorts, the New York Times crossword puzzle editor. 
for whom puzzles are his vocational subordinate goal, which is a goal that he developed, I guess you could easily say by 12 or 13, because I think he was already asking other puzzle makers how he could become a professional puzzle maker in middle school. But even before that, I think he submitted his first puzzle for publication when he was younger than that. So that's his vocational goal. But then he has an avocational subordinate goal, which has been abiding for his whole life, and that's table tennis. So I think you occasionally will find that kind of a vocational and an avocational pursuit. I mean, for me, my vocational pursuit is psychology. And I have this like much less important avocational thing that I've been interested in for a long time, which is cooking and food. So, you know, when I go to bed, you know, and I read books, it's like about, you know, chefs and food and I, you know, read recipe books and so forth. I think that's often the case, right? But but it's also clear to me that, you know, my avocation is my avocation, right? Like it's, you know, it's it's something that I do that I enjoy and I want to get better at it, but it's not as important to me as my vocational goal. And I don't really believe in polymaths. I think especially nowadays, like I was just talking to an economist who's, you know, very prominent in this field. And he said to me that it took him 35 years of working, you know, really actively, right? Like 80 hour weeks in economics to understand what he wanted to study. And I said, why did it take you so long? He's like, well, it takes a really long time to know what's known and then be able to say what's not known. And further to say why it is that what remains to be known remains to be known, like why it hasn't been solved already. And he just can't imagine that as a young economist, as smart as he was, and he probably he thinks he's probably, you know, less smart than he used to be because he's getting older, right? that it just took a really long time. And that's why I don't believe in polymaths. It's just really hard to kind of like pick up basketball and, you know, outperform Kobe Bryant or, you know, pick up painting and kind of like do much that's like meaningfully valuable compared to the other people who have been working on it for much longer, you know, in very short amounts of time. So I don't think you can have a lot of things simultaneously. It is possible, I think, to have them in sequence. But then again, you know, you just run up into the constraint of like, people don't live that long. So maybe you could do, you know, two things in sequence in your lifetime or three things in sequence. But I can't imagine and it's rarely the case that people do many, many things in sequence and become world class in all of them. Right. And that's a great segue into the question about the determinants of becoming world-class, world-class expertise. You have a formula for achievement. Could you just say what that is and why does effort count twice in that formula? So the formula for achievement that I find to be compelling, though I would also admit that we don't have evidence for it, you know, we don't have data yet to say like it's absolutely true, is the following, which is that achievement is the multiplicative product of your skill and your effort. So if you have high skill applied, you know, with a lot of effort over time, cumulative effort, right, that you will achieve a lot, right? This is holding things like luck and opportunity constant. Of course, those things matter. But like assuming you're in the same situation, you have the same amount of luck, then it's the people who have really high skill and really high cumulative effort that are going to actually produce the most, you know, the most beautiful and the best and the highest number of pots, you know, if you're a potter, that kind of thing. Now, that only has effort in the equation once. So you think like, okay, well, what do you mean by effort counting twice? Here's what I mean. You can then ask the question like, okay, that's an interesting thing about skill. You know, we're not all equally skilled. Where does skill come from? I think skill is developed and where skill is developed is, you know, with effort. So I have a second equation, which is say like, well, if you really want to know what skill is, skill is equal to talent times effort. So if you ask the question, well, who's going to become the most skilled person here? It's going to be the person who has the highest amount of talent and who puts the most, the most cumulative effort toward it, right? So somebody who works really hard for a long time, but has um, a high rate of learning, which is how I define talent. So if you just use a little algebra, you find that achievement is therefore talent times effort times effort. So talent times effort squared. And then it's just a little thought experiment. If you change, if you wiggle effort a little bit and you say, well, what happens if you, you know, increase effort by just a little bit? What happens to achievement versus increasing talent? a little bit and what happens to achievement. It's only by virtue of the fact that the effort variable happens twice in the equation that you get a bigger return on that increase in effort because it, it does count twice. It helps you build skill, but it also helps make that skill productive. Could you say that's only given that you've passed a certain threshold of talent? Like what, you know, I mean, I could put in as much effort and practice into becoming a world-class swimmer as I could and I wouldn't get much return on my investment, right? 
Yeah, I mean, if you, it just falls out of the equation that, like, if you multiply anything by a very small number by zero, right, uh-huh. that you still get zero. So, so let's just take the extreme right. example, which is, you know, not really plausible, but you like literally have zero talent in swimming. <laughs> right. That for no matter what effort you put in, there's no gain in skill and there's no gain in, you know, productivity. So then, you know, absolutely, you know, then you would sort of like, you know, it doesn't matter how much effort you would put in. And so I, I think that's true. I mean, one position that I would like to, Clarify, not that everybody has to like worry about like Angela Duckworth and what she thinks about things, but I think the research that I've done by focusing on the psychology of effort and the psychology of like sticking with things, you know, I think there's an easy mistake to be made, which is to think that I don't believe that human beings differ much in their ability to improve in skill, that I don't believe in talent. I do believe in talent. I think that we differ in all kinds of ways, including the rate at which we improve in things. And I would further say that grit and talent and everything else about human beings is partly, although not entirely, a function of our genes. So oh, I think did you just use the G word, Angela Duckworth? I, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm yeah. just joking. It's not I that do, scary as people I think. I don't think genes is as scary as people make it out to be if they really understand the mechanisms of genes, right? I agree. And I think it's really hard to talk about, you know, it's not the fault of people who, you know, don't like immerse themselves in the research literature. Like, I, you know, I don't fault human beings for sort of like having a kind of sometimes a misunderstanding of genes. Like, why should they? I have misunderstandings of lots of things that I don't spend time thinking about. But I do think it's really important to acknowledge that really every aspect of human behavior, including your intelligence, including your preference for broccoli or, you know, your likelihood to vote for, you know, one presidential candidate this fall versus another, you know, they all have some genetic influence. It's not like there's a single grit gene. I think it's really, really well established that even for very simple characteristics like eye color or height, there's not a a gene. There are many genes, dozens, hundreds that interact with each other in mind bogglingly complex ways. And that there's nothing that has been studied where you could say there's really no influence of environment at all in the sense that like the genes are just your destiny, right? Right. Even height, even height. Yeah. Yeah. And even height, right? Right. So, you know, human beings have been getting taller and taller. When you go to museums and you look at these costumes from like the 16th century and they're really small and you're like, oh, why are these so small? It's because people are bigger. And that is not because our genes have changed in that very short time period historically. It's because our environments have become, you know, we eat a lot more, right? You know, we're also fatter, by the way. The gene thing doesn't scare me. I mean, I was a neurobio, so my, you know, I think my undergraduate degree is technically biology with a neurobiology concentration. And then, you know, I have a degree in neuroscience. I'm like, I'm not afraid of biology and I'm not afraid of genetics. I think that these things seem to people to be like, oh, well, then therefore it's not malleable. Like, oh, therefore we shouldn't have, you know, schools devote attention to the like, I think that that's the wrong question. Even, you know, if you think about like, eyesight, like myopia, right? Like you could be nearsighted. Of course, that's very much a function of your genes, right? That really runs in families. But, you know, that doesn't mean that like we couldn't have invented eyeglasses and contact lenses to change, you know, effectively people's vision. So I find it a very understandable, but it's a very misguided kind of way of thinking about all of this. You know, does grit matter? I think so. Does talent matter? I think so. Right. Um, Just because one thing matters doesn't mean nothing else matters. And that's, you know, the media loves, you know, saying this is the thing, you know, that matters. Yeah. And you're yeah, not saying and that I at can't all. control what journalists write. And I try to make these views clear. But sometimes when I read things, I think to myself, like, that's not what I meant. And I don't even right. know if that's what I said. <laughs> right. So, you know, I don't want to become some like cranky academic who's just like mad at everyone all the time. For not, like, <laughs> you're not, you're not. <laughs> you know, but I do, I think that's a really good point to make that, yeah. you, that you're pointing out. Thanks. Yeah. And another, the potential role of genes, I mean, there's, you know, there's this recent study that came out, Pullman, Robert Pullman and colleagues showing that grit has a strong heritability. Well, no, duh. I mean, I think we've gotten to the point in the sense that every psychological trait has a substantial heritability coefficient. And you said that doesn't mean it can't change, but it could mean something. It could mean that people differ in how naturally gritty they are. That could be true as well. You know, there's both sides of that coin. It is true. Isn't it true of everything? Right. I mean, that's the thing, the heritability coefficient. So Robert Plumman sent me the manuscript. So I ran into him. We were on a panel together and the manuscript was still being reviewed. And, you know, he emailed me afterwards and said like, oh, well, you know, I have this manuscript that's under review. And I read it and I emailed him back and I said, of course, I, I'm not surprised, right, that you're getting heritability estimates of between 20 and 37 percent for grit, depending on which facet you're looking at, like which aspect of grit, you know, perseverance being 37 percent heritable, 20 percent 
heritable for consistency of interest, because that is in line with like every other study that's ever been done mm-hmm. on personality traits. There's a second part of that article where he says in the article, he and his co-authors, he's not the first author, that grit is like shockingly, like, yes, it predicts outcomes, particularly perseverance, you know, predicting changes in test scores over or just standardized test scores, I think, for Mm -hmm. this British sample, but not as well as conscientiousness, which we were talking about a few minutes ago. And I said in my email back to him, you know, I'm not surprised about that either, because I've published and, you know, here's the link to the article that I don't think that grit should predict like all aspects of achievement equally. And in fact, um, in my own work. I mean, I've said that, like, for example, self-control should predict your grades better than your grit, because grit is about like really personally meaningful, hard to achieve long-term goals. And self-control is just about anything that you and, and anyone who's ever taught a kid knows that like doing their homework at night and doing well on the test on Friday is less about their personally meaningful, passion-driven goals than just sort of like not watching TV, which is a little bit more fun than studying for history. So I was a little disappointed to find that like none of my comments made it into the, you know, helped, you know, inform the final article. But, you know, that's science and they have the right to write whatever they want to write. But my own feeling and from my own other research, standardized test scores are, you know, they're used in that article to just be like, well, standardized test scores equals School academic achievement. achievement. Yeah. And I think there are many other things. Standardized test scores are not perfectly correlated with your grades. They're not perfectly correlated with your school attendance. They're absolutely not perfectly correlated with graduation. Standardized test scores are a weaker predictor of whether you will graduate from college, for example, than your GPA. They're almost is- perfectly correlated with IQ, by the way. Um, exactly. It, yeah. And what I found, and I think you've also found in your research, is that if you take measures of IQ... And you look at you know how that correlates with uh, standardized test scores, or in work that I've done, like looking at changes in standardized test scores, right? You find really remarkable correlations between IQ and test scores. But if you look at grade point average, right? Which you know we we I mean I, as a former teacher, I'll tell you it's like if you have a kid who really tries hard to learn in your class, they're going to move their grades more than they're going to move their test scores in part because they are given the opportunity to learn the things that are going into their grades, whereas test scores are not, you know, they're not perfectly aligned with what you're doing in school. So there's always an amount of kind of like, all right, I'm going to give you this problem you've never seen before, like go to it. And it's a longer conversation and maybe one we don't have time for this podcast. But, you know, what these intelligence tests are really assessing, I mean, because people just take it as a game, it's like, oh, well, they're assessing intelligence. I don't know that people are stopping to ask themselves like, well, what is that? And, you know, if the general public could actually look at these IQ tests, you know, like if they would actually ever be printed, which they so often aren't because, you know, the publisher doesn't wants to keep them secret because they don't want anyone to be able to cheat on them. Or, mm-hmm. But if you actually look at a lot of IQ tests, they are strikingly similar to standardized tests. So it's sort of like you look at the question and it's like, you know, what is an armadillo? An armadillo is a, you know, kind of animal. An armadillo is a kind of, you know, army. A kind of, and you're like, okay, now I have to guess whether that is from an IQ test right. or from a standardized achievement test. You often can't even tell the difference. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, the correlation between the SAT and IQ is as high as the reliability of the SAT itself. Yeah, that yeah. that article that was published, I think, now more than a decade ago, right, in uh-huh. Psych Science. I mean. You know, I'm not saying that IQ doesn't exist, right? I do think there's absolutely something about, you know, the aptitude to learn new things. And I would further say that we likely differ in that. I would further say that, you know, part of our differences must be accounted for by the DNA that we inherited from our mom and dad and that we're not going to do a whole lot to change, right? Epigenetics aside. So I'm not saying any of these things aren't true. Like, I'm not saying IQ is Or that's not important. You're also not saying it's not important. Yeah. And also not, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I think, you know, if you asked me like, Angela, would you like to have 10 more IQ points? I would say, <laughs> yes, please. Like, I'd love to have 10 more IQ points. I don't think I'm that's super- possible for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's absolutely, trust me, it is absolutely. So it's just, you know, these things are complicated. Yeah. I think oversimplifying, you know, is, is never in anyone's interest. But, you know, anyway, my own view of this recent finding is I'm not surprised that grit is partly heritable at the same level of genetic contribution has been found with other traits. I'm also not surprised that on test scores, alone. Yes, it predicts, but maybe not as well as, um, you know, big five conscientiousness as a whole, which is the major second major finding of that publication. What I don't want readers to come away from, at least what I don't come away is that like a human being's achievement in academics can be perfectly summarized and completely summarized by how they do on a standardized achievement test that takes a few hours. 
Right on, right on. Last part of this interview, let's leave on a positive <laughs> note here, uh, talking about the interventions, some exciting new interventions you and your colleagues are working on, exciting new um, potentially objective measures of grit. Just to throw something out there, I thought really cool, you're developing some novel role-playing interventions. Is that right? So um, the graduate student that I have who has been working on grit and how to change you know, either grit or some of the things that we think gritty people do, right? And that's a, you know, maybe it's a nuanced distinction, but sometimes when we do things like get people to work a little harder and do more deliberate practice, which is one of the things I'll tell you about in a moment, you know, we don't know whether we want to say, oh, this person is definitely grittier, but we do want to say that, you know, when we measure deliberate practice, we can get people to do a little more of it over a certain, you know, short time period, which is about as far as we've gotten. So this student is named Lauren Eskris Winkler. She came to me she was a very, very serious pianist during her whole childhood and adolescence. And she really had a very strong interest in the kind of hard practice that she had to do to become as skilled as she did. Because she was really, really good. Um, I think she considered actually becoming a professional musician, but then decided to go you know, the liberal arts route. And you know, she had this observation that after recitals, for example, people would you know, invariably come up to her and say, gosh, Lauren, you're so talented. You're just you have such a gift for music. And she tried to explain to them that she practiced hours a day at the very limit of her ability. That's what deliberate practice is, to practice beyond where your current skills are, to get feedback on it, on what you've done, on what you've done wrong, of course, right? How you've deviated from what you really wanted to do. And then to like reflect on that and and to experiment a little bit and then, you know, try practicing that whole piece over again, or just that passage. And then you know, doing it over and over and over again for hours a day when you're really at the peak of your training and to do that every day. And I mean, it's almost hard to explain in words like what that means. It's like, you no, know, really imagine for yourself sitting at the piano bench for hours a day doing what you cannot do, struggling with complete concentration and then doing it again, you know, on Tuesday and then doing it again on Wednesday and then get for years. And that's what she did. And so she was really interested in that. Her intervention research, which she gets, you know, really the credit for, not me, is one of the studies that she's going to publish very soon in JPSP is showing that if you teach non-experts, in this case, you know, middle school kids, and she has some other samples too, but they're not selective. They're not like Olympic athletes. If you just teach them like what deliberate practice is and give them the evidence that, you know, most people who do deliberate practice don't find it fun. They find that it's actually very frustrating because they're doing things and getting a lot of failure feedback. If they just knew that that they might actually do more of it, right? Because it might make them feel that when they're confused and the way they think it's really hard, well, that that's normal, not a sign that they can't learn. And so she's found in random assignment, placebo-controlled, longitudinal studies, that she's able to increase the amount of deliberate practice and actually objective measures of achievement, especially among those who are sort of below the median, below average in their achievement or their skill coming into the experiment. Now, she finds this effect, you know, is there, it's visible, it's reliable, you know, a month later, you know, if you go out and ask yourself four months later, do these middle school kids continue to, you know, work harder, the effect is now no longer reliable. So it's in the right direction, but it's not statistically significant. That makes us think that like, yes, there's some psychological slack in the system that you can get kids to work harder than they did and do better than they've done. But it's naive to think that a little intervention is going to change their beliefs and change the way they work forever. So we're not selling this as kind of like a 30 minute cure for a low grit personality. But we are saying that like, wow, there might be potential in people that they're not realizing. And that if we had, you know, a lot of reinforcement of these beliefs and practices, like if teachers knew this and you know regularly reinforced it in the language they used when they assigned, you know, homework, when they gave back tests to kids, that maybe that that effect would actually be able to be sustained. So that's one thing she's doing. And and you had mentioned some other things that, you know, like about identity and so forth. Those are other directions that, you know, we're also taking a happy to say more about those. Yeah. And I'll link to some of your articles on the uh, podcast uh, show notes page so people can read that. And, you know, a lot of people uh, have been using the character report card to measure some of these things. And there, there's some other options for measuring grit. I know you're working on an academic diligence task, right? And so I'll put up, you know, as many resources as I can so that people can get a better picture. So, look, I want to thank you so much for talking to me today, Angela. I consider you a friend as well as a colleague. And I really value. The work you do, and I think, you know, you're going to be on book tour soon, and you're going to blow up even more (laughs) than you already have. I hope this was helpful as practice a little bit as well for the kind of criticisms you might get. And I hope I highlighted that your work does show a level of nuance that people might not be aware of. Well, thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. You're also a dear friend and a terrific thought partner. And um, I guess maybe in in closing, let me say that, you know, I, 
I'm sure I'm wrong about a lot of things. That's what science is all about. I hope to be less wrong over time. But, you know, the criticism is great, right? Criticism, you know, is not always correct, but sometimes is and invariably makes you think about things a little more carefully and makes you learn more. Wonderful. I love that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.